Not an inch. The man who took us to war offers no regrets to the Iraq inquiry. Tonight, no apologies, no regrets. A full, robust defence of the road to war in Iraq from the man who took us there. Well, this isn't about a, a lie or a conspiracy or a deceit or a deception. It's a decision. The former Prime Minister said removing Saddam Hussein in 2003 prevented a worse problem and even a nuclear arms race with Iran in 2010. Tony Blair said that he believed beyond doubt that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction. And no regret. Responsibility, but not a regret for removing Saddam Hussein. We'll hear from senior politicians on both sides of the Atlantic and people who've been directly affected by the war. And leading political commentators give their assessment of where this inquiry leaves us now. Good evening. It was, as even his opponents concede, a characteristically robust performance from Tony Blair. He answered questions for some six hours and everything from how the perception of the threat from Iraq changed after 9-11 to the failures in planning for the aftermath of the war. Not once did the former Prime Minister seem ill at ease, perhaps with the exception of some nervousness at first, and then some dense arguments about the legality of the war and the reasons for seeking a second UN resolution. Toppling Saddam in 2003, Mr Blair said, means the world in 2010 is a safer place. We begin our coverage tonight with David Grossman's assessment of what we learned. The Iraq war looms so large in Tony Blair's premiership that it's hard sometimes to see beyond it. It is possible that instead of appearing before an inquiry today, this man might still be prime minister, but for his decision to join with the United States in Operation Iraqi Freedom in the spring of 2003. The protesters had a practiced feel. As well they might, they've had seven years to rehearse their anger. Inside the inquiry, the object of their fury looked nervous, like a retired athlete forced into the blocks for an unwelcome race. In the two and a half years since he's left Downing Street, Mr Blair's fundamental defence of the Iraq war hasn't altered. Well, this isn't about a, a lie or a conspiracy or a deceit or a deception. It's a decision. And the decision I had to take was... Given Saddam's history, given his use of chemical weapons, given the over one million people whose deaths he caused, given, given 10 years of breaking UN resolutions, could we take the risk of this man reconstituting his weapons programs? One of the fundamental questions this inquiry is seeking to answer is why we went to war. At the heart of this is the relationship between Tony Blair and George Bush. Regime change in Iraq was the firm policy of the US government since 1998, but it couldn't be the overt policy of the UK government. A, a foreign policy objective of regime change I regarded as uh, improper and also self-evidently unlawful, but leave aside the, the lawfulness of, of it. Uh, it had no chance of being a runner uh, in the United Kingdom, would not have got my support. Instead, Tony Blair's publicly stated policy was to force the disarmament of Iraq via the UN. Regime change might happen, but it wasn't the primary objective. Indeed, even a month before the war, Mr Blair told the Commons that Saddam could stay in power. I detest his regime. I hope most people do. But even now, he could save it by complying with the UN's demand. But was this really the case? Some suggest that Tony Blair was determined that Saddam should be removed, if necessary, by force. A deal, it is alleged, was done during a visit to George Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas, in April of 2002. To this day, I'm not entirely clear what degree of convergence was, if you like, signed in blood uh, um, at, at, at the Crawford ranch. But today, Mr Blair emphatically denied any secret deal. What I was saying to President Bush, and I wasn't saying this privately, incidentally, I was saying it publicly, 
was we are going to be with you in confronting and dealing with this threat. There was no, <laughs> I mean, the one thing I, I, I was not doing was dissembling in that. In a recent interview, Mr Blair seemed to suggest that Iraqi WMD were just a way of presenting a policy of regime change. If you had known then that there were no WMDs, would you still have gone on? I would still have thought it right to remove them. I mean, obviously, you would have had to use um, and deploy different arguments about the nature of the threat. So was this interview evidence of what many, including his one-time Cabinet Secretary Lord Turnbull, believe that Tony Blair's real policy objective was regime change? Right, well, let me um, deal with the Firm Britain I interview. And, um, Sir Audrey, even uh, with all my experience in uh, dealing with interviews, um, it still indicates that, that, that uh, I've, I've got um, something to learn about it. Just a slip of the tongue, an explanation that didn't go down very well among the audience behind Mr Blair. Because the policy was disarmament, it was vital for Tony Blair to show that Iraq wasn't complying with UN resolutions and still had WMD. Most governments around the world thought he did, but evidence was hard to come by. The UK government produced a dossier in the name of the intelligence services in September of 2002. Tony Blair's head of communications, Alistair Campbell, took an active role in its production. In its foreword, Tony Blair said the intelligence was, quote, beyond doubt. He told Parliament... It is extensive, detailed and authoritative. It concludes that Iraq has chemical and biological weapons, that Saddam has continued to produce them, in reality, we now know the intelligence was in fact patchy and sporadic. Was it wise to say that intelligence is ever beyond doubt? I did believe it. I mean, that was the... And I did believe it, frankly, beyond doubt. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, we look back on the situation differently. But let me just say what was troubling me at the time was... Supposing we put it the other way around, and it was correct and I wasn't going to act on it. That was the thing that worried me. Tony Blair is also accused of a casual and unminited style of government, a small group of insiders making big decisions, the wider cabinet not seen as up to the job. You'll get a collection of individuals of uh, variable competence, of variable... Um, trustworthiness in the Prime Minister's eyes and sometimes he would want to have discussions with a smaller group of people. The International Development Secretary Claire Short was kept on the outside, not even shown an important cabinet paper on options for Iraq, discussed among a small group of insiders at Chequers. Mr Blair though today maintained that there was still cabinet Very deliberation. Is that I was never short of people challenging me on it. So can you identify who, who they were? Well, there were people within the cabinet, obviously. Um, for example, Robin Cook and from time to time Claire Short. Would... But they weren't at the Chequers meeting? No, they weren't, but we would discuss this. We discussed, obviously, prior to um, the invasion of Iraq, I think there mm. were no fewer than 24 different cabinet meetings. This was, this was a topic that was right through the mainstream But you didn't of discuss UK the politics. options paper in cabinet? We didn't discuss the options paper specifically in Cabinet, but it, we it certainly didn't even discussed... go to all the Cabinet. I mean, the, Claire Short didn't get a paper. She complained that she hadn't got it in the first place. Yes, but the, the discussion that we had in Cabinet was a substantive discussion. We had it again and again and again. Another element of the Iraq war on which Mr Blair was closely questioned today was the planning, both civil and military. The inquiry had been previously told that the armed forces had been prevented from ordering vital equipment until very late in the day. I was not allowed to um, uh, speak, to, for example, to the Chief of Defence Logistics. I was prevented from doing that by the Secretary of State uh, for uh, defence because of the concern about uh, becoming public knowledge that we were planning for a uh, uh, military contribution. But Mr Blair said that the armed forces were very much ready by the time operations began. Had anyone at any stage come to me and said, it's not safe to do this because of the lack of proper military preparation, I would have 
um, taken that very, very seriously indeed. But they didn't, and they got on with it, and they did it magnificently, as they always do. Although the initial phase of the military operation was swiftly won, the aftermath was bloody chaos. Not poor planning, Mr Blair said, just the wrong assumptions. He'd assumed that Iraqi civil government would continue to function and that Iran wouldn't meddle, both, as it turned out, wrong. The last question of the day brought the first outburst from the public seats. And no regret. Responsibility, but not a regret for removing Saddam Hussein. I think he was a, Be quiet, please. I think that he was a monster. I believe he threatened not just the region but the world. And in the circumstances that we faced then, but I think even if you look back now, it was better to deal with this threat, to deal with it, to remove him from office. Seven years after the Iraq invasion, with opinions on the war so entrenched, it's unlikely that Tony Blair's appearance today changed many minds. Time and again, he said he had to do what he thought was right. It was a matter of judgment. Now, the judgment that matters is the opinion of the Iraq inquiry panel of the decisions that Tony Blair made. Arriving home tonight, Tony Blair has a long wait to discover what the panel made of his evidence today. The Iraq Inquiry report isn't due until the end of the year. I'm joined now by Margaret Beckett, who was in the Cabinet in the run-up to the war, Simming Campbell, who resolutely opposed British involvement, Sarah Chapman, whose brother died in the war, and from Washington by John Bolton, who served in the Bush administration, including as UN ambassador. Sarah Chapman, I noticed that when Mr Blair was asked about his regrets, just there, you put your head in your hands. Why? Because it's painful to hear that. Um, went there with an open mind. I didn't expect any revelations. I certainly didn't expect to get any openness or truth. Um, he didn't fail to deliver in his polished political um, performance. But to say that there was re regrets, there, within that kind of remit really, certainly as bereaved families, we were looking for at least acknowledgement of the suffering that we, as a country, so those of us who have lost loved ones um, and those of us that kind of now support the troops and really feel really the reality of what's going on with our troops then and still now today. Margaret Beckett, did, were you surprised that the Prime Minister didn't express, at least or former Prime Minister, didn't express uh, at least some regret for the loss of life? Only for about half a second and then I realised that the terrible danger that we're in with all this interpretation of words all the time, I have not the slightest shadow of doubt that like every single one of us, he regrets every death, that there was on the side of our troops or in the wider population or whatever. But the minute he says he regrets, that will be taken, twisted, blown out of all proportion. And the last thing he would want is for people who have lost loved ones in the war to think that he's saying they died for no good cause. So, Ming, do, do you take that point that, you know, if, he, mm. if he'd said it in that way, as Margaret Beckett says, you know, the headlines would be Tony Blair backtracks or, or, or something, and it would have made the sacrifice of many, many people seem to some people to be worthless? I think he missed an opportunity. I take a different view from Margaret Beckett. Of course, politicians are used to their words being misinterpreted and twisted. But that was right at the very end of six hours of evidence. He was asked a direct question by the chairman of the inquiry. I think he missed an opportunity to express sympathy for those who had lost loved ones. Um, John Bolton, there were all kinds of interesting bits to this. I was really struck by what he, what he said was the 2010 question, which was, if we had not removed Saddam Hussein in 2003, would the world be any safer in 2010? No, it wouldn't. I mean, what did you think of that? Well, of course, the world would have been much more dangerous had we left Saddam in power. Uh, there's no doubt that he would have sought nuclear weapons as soon as he was free from UN sanctions and weapons inspectors. Uh, he had kept together over a thousand scientists and technicians he called his nuclear mujahideen, uh, and he would have been on the path. Not only that, Libya, which gave up its nuclear weapons program when Muammar Gaddafi feared the same fate as Saddam Hussein, undoubtedly would have continued its progress toward nuclear weapons and perhaps others would as well. I, th I think it was a very pertinent question that, uh, that uh, Tony Blair put. Sir Ming, and also that raised the specter, he was very tough on Iran mm. as well. And if 
uh, if you followed the reasoning that Ambassador Bolton just said there and that the uh, former Prime Minister was saying, we could have had two potentially nuclear powers on that, in that area. It would have been disastrous for us in 2010. Yes, but this is speculation. And where do you stop? Uh, we know that AQ Khan of Pakistan went round quite a few countries in the world unloading the information by which to construct nuclear weapons. Are we going to identify all of these countries and take steps to try and prevent them acquiring nuclear weapons? If we're going to do that, we're going to be very busy indeed. And on Libya, the efforts to persuade Libya to give up weapons of mass destruction predated any question of Iraq. My complaint about the Prime Minister really is that uh, he never re addressed the fact uh, that to embark upon this uh, alongside the United States was to ignore the overwhelming international law obstacles. Uh, he had to deal with the question of uh, intelligence. He said it was beyond doubt, although we now know it was patchy and sporadic. Uh, he acted in a way it was cavalier so far as the uh, legal implications of this were concerned, nor did he ever fully come clean about the nature of the promises he made to George W. Bush. And, of course, we've never seen the private exchange of correspondence well, let, upon... Let's bring in Margaret Beckett, because I know Margaret Beckett will dispute most of that. I mean, in, ter in terms of the legality, though, I mean, it was suggested that the Attorney General, Peter Goldsmith, wanted to brief the full Cabinet on how finely balanced the legal judgments were in this matter, but it, that was vetoed because it might have leaked out. I mean, the suggestion was that you and the Cabinet weren't fully informed about everything, including these very complicated legal questions. I'm glad you asked me that because I was thinking about it this afternoon because I noticed listening to the inquiry and they asked me briefly about this myself um, that uh, they asked Tony Blair why the cabinet um, didn't discuss in more depth when the Attorney General put his formal view but what I, I think probably none of us have ever said is that actually we had had a very full and comprehensive and detailed explanation from both Tony and Jack over a period of weeks, long before we got to the time of taking the decision to go to it, to, uh, to send troops in. So we knew all about the implications of the different resolutions and what people had said in the negotiation and what it might mean and how you could interpret it. The Cole Cabinet was familiar with all that. So of course we didn't take a decision like that lightly or frivolously. Sarah Chapman, the Cabinet was informed. Well, it depends if you look at the Cabinet as the Cabinet's maybe as it should have been and maybe not the cherry-picked um, advisers that were placed onto that Cabinet. You know, the removal of the chance to actually fully debate certainly the legal implications by having Lord Goldsmith in, in the Cabinet um, to actually be able to debate with the Cabinet as full um, basically is, I think, something that has blown a, a large hole into this as but far I as I'm concerned. I don't, know whether, I don't know whether Sarah is, is really aware because it's only come out very recently because you don't normally talk about things that happen at Cabinet. But the Cabinet on no less than 24 occasions discussed these issues in depth and at length over many weeks. So this picture that's been painted by people but, who were but, never but, at the Cabinet, but, 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 but that we somehow didn't yeah. talk about it, is nonsense. The Gallaty lay right at the very heart of this. And we now know that the uh, legal advisers in the Foreign Office took the view that it was illegal for Great Britain to participate yes. in something of this kind. We now know that the Attorney General produced an opinion dated the 7th of March which set out all of the doubts and the reservations with regard to legality. But we also know that but the we Attorney also General know that changed the, his mind. We also know the Cabinet never saw that document. What the Cabinet eventually saw was a document on the 17th of what? March as the debate began uh, which set out on one page the belief that it was legal to go I, to war. I, I want to bring in Ambassador Bolton again and just on the thoughts about uh, relations between the United States and Britain over this. I mean, there was no secret deal signed in blood, according to, to Mr Blair, but we were always shoulder to shoulder with the Americans. And President Bush gave him, Tony Blair, a way out if the British had wanted it. Is, is, is that the way you understand it? I, I want to come back to the legality issue. I think this is very important. Uh, th this was a very easy question. And to the extent you've got a lot of lawyers in the United Kingdom who can't find a way for Britain lawfully to use force to defend itself against the kind of threat that a regime like Saddam's posed indicates that you're on a road toward national suicide. This was unambiguous in my view, both as a matter of American law, which I was concerned about, and to the extent that anybody cares about it, 
international law. And but, but all American, of this... But, but American law is different. Can I finish, please, yes, sir? Of course. Do you mind? Uh, all of this chatter about international law, in fact, was what drove Prime Minister Blair toward what I think was his greatest vulnerability uh, of trying to show that Saddam's weapons capability was an imminent threat. Uh, that pushed him uh, and the British government and then the American government back to seeking Resolution right. 1441. Okay. We didn't need that resolution at all. Well, American law is different on this matter. I think in 1998 there was a, there was a piece of legislation went through the Congress which had the effect of saying that the policy of the American government should be regime change. Now, regime change is illegal under Article 2 of the United Nations Charter. The British government it could not possibly not. act in that way. Uh, we've only got, uh, Ambassador Bullen, we've, we've only got a minute left. I just wanted to bring in Margaret Becker. One other thing that uh, Mr. Blair said, he said, we didn't end up with a humanitarian disaster. That is absolutely not how it is seen in Iraq and surrounding countries. Oh, I think, I, no, I, I think you're, you're wrong about that. I think what he meant, and Jeff Hoon, if I recall correctly, and others have referred to this, there was an understanding that there could be, uh, I mean, after all, we were told that the Iraqi people were 60% dependent on the World Food, food Programme, I think it was, for their food. There could have been a breakdown of the supply of food, of water, of any electricity, uh, a complete collapse of the, of the um, structures of civil society. Well, didn't that, that, isn't that, that pretty did much what happened? Happen in the, no, Re really? What happened was that people, st first of all, it was in a worse condition than anybody thought. And second, the fast, as fast as we tried to repair and improve it, other people blew it up because the last thing they wanted was a stable, successful Iraq. OK, we'll leave it there. Thank you all very much. Now, two of the Chilcot Inquiry panel are distinguished historians, of course, and there is no doubt that the Iraq War ranks alongside Suez in 1956 as one of the great historical events in British post-war history. But after this inquiry and all the others, have, have these matters been put to rest? Is there a lasting political legacy for the next Prime Minister and the one, one after that? Is Iraq still a relevant political issue even? I'm joined now by two top political commentators, Steve Richards of The Independent and Fraser Nelson, who's editor of The Spectator. Is it still a relevant political issue? I mean, this was very interesting and very important, but people are not going to be voting on that in 2010. People vote on all sorts of things, including whether they are still angry with the government for the Iraq war. And I do think that in bringing this back up, Gordon Brown, in having this inquiry, he has actually raised all these memories which were fading. And now we've got Blair himself. Gordon Brown's going to be in the chair this time next month. And I don't see how it can do him any favours, but there are very relevant issues. One thing which nobody has discussed, not even Blair was talking about, was Basra and the way which we basically let down those people, we abandoned them to the militiamen. That was Britain's responsibility, which we reneged upon. The Chilcot Inquiry has given us information we never had before about how bad things were. It was a chapter of history that was never opened until now. So I do think that this is relevant because if we are to remain a war-fighting country rather than a peacekeeping peace military, as Mr. Blair puts it, then we need to know why did we make mistakes, why did we lose? And to me, that was Blair's sin, not lying, but, losing. But haven't most people already made up their mind? They made up their mind either this was an illegal war and we were against it, or actually this was justified, there were threats, uh, and we needed to do something. But and it didn't change very many people's mind today. I, I suspect... I'd be amazed if a single voter changed their minds on the basis of the six hours that we witnessed today of Tony Blair. Of course, a lot of people won't have seen the whole six hours, incidentally. We're very absorbed by it. Um, and so, therefore, it's not going to be a sort of decisive issue in the election. But there's no doubt at all that it's a sort of background hum in the build-up to the election and will reinforce certain impressions about the way this government has projected information and so on. And, and, and if people think this government is full of liars, that will be reinforced. Others will take a different view. So it's, it's there, but it won't be decisive. Well, it did, really won't be did decisive. You think, did you think there was a legacy thing going on here? This was him justifying himself to history, among other, oh, <laughs> among, among other people, you including tomorrow's newspapers. You get the impression he'd answered these questions in his head a, a thousand times in the last four or five years. 
And this was, this was his mastermind specialist subject, Tony Blair. He was there on completely on top of his brief with a stack full of notes. And sure, he has legitimized it to himself. To, he must get asked it all the time. So I don't think he was, and that's why he didn't apologize or even come close to it, because he doesn't think he's anything to be sorry for, um, including the screw up in Basra. Did you, did you agree with Margaret Beckett's point there that once you start apologising, people unpick it and it gets worse? Because there are others who would say, well, look, you know, this was a matter of decision. It wasn't evil versus good. It was somebody who perhaps took some decisions which were wrong. Contrition becomes impossible when you take troops to war and people get killed. Because if you think about it afterwards for a leader to say, um, look, mistakes were made, I'm sorry, you're actually sort of implying that the deaths were unnecessary. And so for con contrition is impossible. There are still, though, I think, unanswered questions. The first part of the session today was very interesting, I think, where Tony Blair said very early on, after September the 11th, we had to deal with Saddam. Why? Saddam wasn't connected with September the 11th. I think there's general acceptance about that. And that, to me, really, is the unanswered question. But there was Once... the perception of the threat. You know, if this guy is bad, if he has WMD, he could see what happened on September 11th and do very, very bad things. That the, was the, the, the But the there jump. were about three ifs there <laughs> in, your, in your question. And that, to me, seems to me fundamental. Uh, we know the American administration reached that conclusion within hours of September the 11th. Tony Blair did so as well. But was that because he was determined to stick with America or because he felt it with absolute conviction? I'm not sure what the sequence was, but from that moment on, it seems to me that his course was absolutely set. Once you have decided that September the 11th meant you had to deal with Saddam in alliance with uh, the, the divided Bush administration, everything else was almost inevitable. and He's been justifying it ever since, but I still don't know why he entirely why he took that original decision. Where, where do you think this leaves the next Prime Minister, whoever it is, if it's David Cameron or if it's Gordon Brown again or what, whatever happens? I mean, does our future Prime Minister is going to look at this and think, this is how my judgments are going to be unpicked? Certainly. I cannot see Britain embarking on another expeditionary mission um, like this. Um, for the foreseeable future. The public opinion has been turned against it so much. This is what this is all about, this feeling that we were misled and lied and the whole war was a deceit. Um, it certainly wasn't, in my view, but that opinion means it's going to be so much more difficult. If, if say, for example, if Tony Blair is right and Iran does kick off and there is some kind of international force needs to be sent there, David Cameron, if he's prime minister, is really going to have to think hard. Just, am I really going to get permission to send troops out there given what's happened in Iraq? I think this will tie the hands of prime ministers for years to come. Do you agree? I, I agree with Fraser about this, and this is really quite sort of profound uh, consequences of this, is that actually I think uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown reached the conclusion that a Labour government could never say no to America in relation to war, but as a result of what has happened, Cameron and a future Labour leader probably can't say yes to America in relation to war, and that is a very, very interesting consequence. Thank you both very much. Coming up in just a moment, live from Glasgow, The Review Show. Here's Kirsty with the details. Kirsty. Gavin, tonight in The Review Show, we'll be talking about J.D. Salinger's ultimate teen rebel, Holden Caulfield. We'll explore our 21st century obsession with angels in everything from the film of The Lovely Bones to the book Some, which Stephen Fry is raving about. And we'll have live music from Daruti Column. Paul Morley, A.L. Kennedy, Kate Moss and Richard Coles will assess Tony Blair's performance today too. Join us in a couple of minutes. Thanks very much, Kirsty. Now we'll have a quick look at tomorrow morning's front pages, those that uh, we have anyway. The Independent has uh, a picture of Tony Blair giving evidence, saying, no apologies, no regrets, and if it was up to me, Iran could be next. It has in brackets. The, uh, the Guardian has righteous, responsible, but no regrets. Blair's day in the dock and some uh, pictures from the, uh, the six-hour session. A ghost walked in, his hands shook, then the extraordinary happened. Simon Jenkins' uh, column underneath. Uh, the Daily Telegraph has uh, Tony Blair on the front page and the hanging crowd bays for blood as Blair faces his inquisitors. But also it's got a story about the private life of the England captain, John Terry, and uh, how that was overturned uh, in the courts today. The uh, FT has bankers in favour of paying a global tax. And of course, there's Tony Blair 
uh, in the top right-hand corner, going to war is a decision I would take again, it says. Uh, that's all from Newsnight tonight. We're back, of course, on Monday at the usual time. Have a good weekend. Good night. Culture Debate with Kirsty Walk now on BBC Two, live from Glasgow. It's The Review Show. Welcome to The Review Show. Who wants flowers when you're dead? As J.D. Salinger's anti-hero Holden Caulfield once said, we revisit Catch in the Rye and discuss cultural imaginings of life after death. Tonight on The Review Show, Life After Death, Angels and Ministers. You ought to go to a boys' school sometime. Try it. The literary world mourns J.D. Salinger. Did teenage kicks begin and end with Holden Caulfield? I was alive in my own perfect world. The lovely Bones imagines a life after death. Why are we so obsessed with the afterlife and angels? Just about everybody I meet wants to talk about angels. And are Van Gogh's letters the key to his intellectual identity? It's a cultural phenomenon, it's glee. Plus the highlights of the week according to Hot Chip. And if we have time after all that, we'll talk about Tony Blair's performance today too. But my guests, Richard Coles, Kate Moss, A.L. Kennedy and Paul Morley are all here because they've pondered the life hereafter, as have Daruti Column, who play us out tonight with their homage to Tony Wilson. So tonight our guests are qualified to engage in matters of life, death and the afterlife because that's our big debate later. But first we have to turn to a notable death this week. J.D. Salinger's passing has inevitably turned the spotlight back on his most famous book. Catcher in the Rye was the novel that spoke to the post-war generation of teenagers and its hero Holden Caulfield spoke a new language steeped in slang suffused with the arrogance of disaffected youth. But is it now a period piece? Let's hear from Caulfield yourself. You're sweet, she said. But you could tell she wanted to change the damn subject. You ought to go to a boys' school sometime. Try it sometime, I said. It's full of phonies. And all you do is study so that you could learn enough to be smart enough to be able to buy a goddamn Cadillac someday. And you have to keep making believe you give a damn if the football team loses. And all you do is talk about girls and liquor and sex all day. And everybody sticks together in these dirty little goddamn cliques. The guys that are on the basketball team stick together. The Catholics stick together. The goddamn intellectuals stick together. The guys that play bridge stick together. Even the guys that belong to the goddamn Book of the Month Club stick together. 